Hold on, let me check. Good afternoon. No, I think it's good evening already. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Calvelli, and I'm going to be serving as your moderator this evening. And before we get started, I, I am going to make this a little bit interactive. How many know anything about WCS? Great. So the first three slides are going to go very quickly. Um, and they're not going at all. Hold on, there we go. We've all probably seen this at other presentations. This is kind of, we call it the bullseye within WCS. Literally, what we're all about is saving wildlife and wild places through three major components, discover, inspire, and protect. Moving right along. And how do we do that? I mean, one of the things that we all know, obviously, is the work that our zoos and aquariums do. And these five institutions are helping to inspire and educate over four million people every year. But more importantly, there are also centers of conservation, conservation action, and actual conservation from a programmatic perspective. And of course, all of this ties back to these 16 priority regions where we work that's home to about 50% of the world's biological diversity. And I did that in under 45 seconds. That's WCS, right? Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to the Facebook Live audience that's watching this as well. So we could give you a little bit of a primer. But in the end, it comes down to this, to these species that we're thinking about, that these six priority species groups that we work through, and I'm not gonna, I think we all know what they are, but fundamentally, we realize that through the eyes of wildlife, we can help tell our story, but more importantly, save nature and save these wild places that we care about. So my job today, as some of you know, I am involved in the campaign work and the advocacy work that we're doing, so I'm gonna take you through a very brief where we are on some of the campaigns. But before that, I want you all to realize that you are grass to me. <laughs> and you are grass tops, right? So these are terms that we use, grass roots and grass tops. The last several years, what we have been doing is working on developing our grass roots. And I'm happy to say that we now have over 2 million people on our database that are there to engage in the work that we do. You are the grass tops. You are the people that are really engaged in our work, that support the work that we do. In many respects, the people that can help make things happen. And one of the programs that if anyone is interested to chat with me afterwards is about is the Wildlife Advocate Program, where we really want you to be our advocates with public officials, people of influence, because it's very important for us to get in front of our elected officials, in front of our public officials, to tell the story in a meaningful way. And there's candidly no one better than the people in this room to do it. So very quickly, um, as many of you may have heard from prior presentations, we've been working on this issue of, of bison, and specifically making the bison the national mammal. And we were successful last year. No, this is not a, a, hat, com you know, a hat convention at the Bronx Zoo. Uh, that is actually President Teddy Roosevelt when he helped to form the American Bison Society. This, unfortunately, is some of the legacy of what was happening. 30 million bison down to about 21 in the wild and a few hundred what were called gentlemen herds. And again, thanks to the work of the Bronx Zoo and the American Bison Society and our first director, William Hornaday, we were able to save those species. And I love telling this story as, as kind of a Bronxite that if you go out to those federal reserves, many of them, you, those animals can trace their roots back to the Bronx. And I mean, that is a great conservation story, right? <laughs> And we're fortunate, and we're fortunate t today to have the, the person who's actually leading the next generation of that work, Dr. Pat Thomas, and I know that Dr. Thomas will be available to answer any questions later on. Very quickly, moving on to elephants and the work that we've done with 96 elephants. As you know, we helped to create a coalition of over 200 organizations in 45 states. We've been able to close the ivory markets. We've been able here in New York, in California, in Hawaii, and also in Nevada. Uh, but more importantly, this work was really instrumental in helping to raise awareness and telling that story, and China's decided to close their markets. And if you think there isn't a problem in New York, um, this was two tons of ivory that was uh, collected in New York in the last three years, illegal ivory, that we crushed in um, this summer, the week before World Elephant Day. So when we think about these issues, they're not just happening somewhere else, they're happening right here in New York. Uh, in Nigeria, working on this issue of a Nigeria superhighway, this road that was going to go right through the heartland of the Cross River Gorilla, some of the last habitats for the Cross River Gorilla, we were able to get over 100,000 individuals, probably many of you, how many of you in this room signed those petitions? Okay, the rest of you will talk later. 
The bottom line is that working together, we were able to get the Nigerian government to change the route and save those sites. And this is an incredible victory for the people that were involved on the ground because over 200,000 Akuri, Akuri people that were living in those areas would also have been moved. Uh, 450M, this, I'm, you're one of the first groups to hear about this. It's a campaign that we're about to launch to help save sharks. As many of you know, sharks are in deep, deep peril, um, and we are very concerned about their future. We are literally helping to coordinate and lead a very diverse coalition of the animal welfare community, the zoo and aquarium community, and the fishermen, the fisher community, all coming together on one piece of legislation, and you'll be hearing more of that in the, in the uh, months ahead. I just want to share this. I, I got a chance to go to um, Belize and Guatemala with Congressman Engel, and this is a photo that we took, that I took uh, on the atoll, one of the reserves where we work in Glover's Reef, uh, where we were doing, we do marine research. And I, you know, how idyllic can that be, right? It's just a gorgeous, like, my God, I'm so lucky to work for this organization. And yet, this is, um, we're 30 miles out in the ocean, 30 miles out to sea, and what I see out in front is plastic. And I share that just as a cautionary tale that what we're doing to our waters are, is an incredible sin. And candidly, we have a moral responsibility to do something different. And that is another issue that we're going to be working on in the months ahead and probably turning to many of you to help us as we raise the awareness of those things. This week, we had the opportunity to hear from one of our great uh, scientists, Dr. James Watson, who talked a little bit about the human footprint. And some of you have heard about the human footprint through the years. Um, this is really kind of what is left of the planet that, is not, that has not been touched in any meaningful way by human hands. And what we find is fundamentally that only about 23% of, of the world is left as true wilderness, these last wild places. And these are the places where WCS works. These are the places that we feel we need to hold on to because of the species that are there, because of the ecosystem services that they provide, the carbon that they sequester, the animals that are there. And fundamentally, this is what we are talking about in many respects when we talk about the work of the Wildlife Conservation Society. So what you're going to hear from tonight are two incredible individuals, uh, Dr. Liz Bennett, and, and, uh, do, and uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, who are gonna give us two different perspectives on the work that we're doing. Please hold your questions till the end. Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A afterwards, and we'll, you'll get a chance to ask those questions. But think about where you sit as we think about all these things and how you can be a part of it and some of the questions that you'd wanna ask these incredible scientists. And I wanted to just leave you with that, because uh, this photo, because when we think about our work, we kind of use the lens of from the lens of wildlife, looking through the lens of wildlife. And hopefully this evening you'll have a better sense of, do we have a chance to save these vanishing species? So with that, I wanted to ask our first speaker, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett. Uh, you probably have the bio in the back. I will just leave you with two quick snippets as she comes up. Dr. Bennett spent 24 years working in Malaysia and 18 of those years in Sarawak. She has been the head of our species program for the past many years. And she is an incredible resource, not only for WCS, but for the community at large, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, welcome, particularly since the temperature seems to be going down rather. It's nice to see a good, warm, full house. So the theme of the evening is, are we winning the race to save vanishing species? And so uh, we are going to, I'm going to talk about the terrestrial species and my colleague and good friend Howard are going to talk about marine species. So are we winning the race? Let's have a look. If we just look at number of species threatened with extinction, it doesn't look very good. 21% of all mammals on the planet are threatened with extinction. That's 13% of all birds, 20% of all reptiles, and 32% of all amphibians. Now that doesn't perhaps sound too bad, but if we, if we focus in on particular groups, it goes way up. So tortoises and turtles, 60% are threatened with extinction, and primates, pretty much the same. So we really have got a lot of work to do. 
far too many to protect individually because that's tens and tens of thousands of species that we're talking about here. We can't possibly do a species plan for all of them. And that's just the terrestrial vertebrates before we get to all the others. So WCS's approach is to work with governments to create protected areas in these last big wild areas of the world because that then saves whole suites of species. So these are protected areas where WCS has worked to establish uh, with their respective governments since uh, 19, 1907 um, more than 280. So that's a lot. Um, and it's extremely impressive. And as you can see, they're, they're pretty much uh, disseminated globally. And those save large suites of species. Now, we don't necessarily stay in every protected area that we help to, to protect, because if the government's doing a good job, if there's a partner there who's doing a good job, we can save our resources for somewhere else. But of the places where we work, uh, as, as John mentioned, about half of all uh, mammals and birds occur in the areas where we're currently working to conserve. So that's an incredibly efficient way, if you like, to save a very large number number of species. But there's some species that uh, even that doesn't help, even if they're big wild areas, and they're the ones, like the ivory, that are targeted for the wildlife trade. Uh, and poachers will go into these protected areas and target these species, so even protected areas, uh, at least if they're just on paper, is not saving these species. We think about rhinos and elephants in this context, but it affects a whole suite of other species, from tigers to pangolins, the scaly anteaters of Africa and Asia, to parrots, to tortoises and turtles. And it's the trade which is, is why that very high proportion of tortoises and turtles are threatened because effectively they have no defense. You can just walk into a protected area and pick one up and walk out with it um, because they didn't evolve to combat that sort of threat. So uh, the result of some of these things, I'm going to focus on three particular uh, species here. Um, one is tigers, because of course we do a lot of work across the Asia on tigers. Um, there's only just over 3,000 left in the wild. Only about 1,000 of those are breeding females, even though there's a lot of area of good habitat left. So a study that was done a couple of years ago, led by uh, WCS's Joe Walston, showed that 70% of remaining tigers are in just 6% of remaining habitat. So there is quite a lot of habitat left relative to the number of tigers because they're really being targeted for their bones, for the, for the bone trade, for traditional medicines. Forest elephants, also a pretty gloomy picture. In this 10-year period, again, WCS-led research, we lost 62% of all forest elephants. One of the things that WCS does, apart from try to protect things, is document what's going on, and so we then know where we really need to focus our efforts. Um, and as we all know, that was for, that's for the ivory trade, um, to largely to Asia, but clearly to the US and Europe and, and other parts of the world as well. Then the other one that I'm going to talk about a bit different is Burmese star tortoises. They, by the mid-2000s, uh, uh, I don't know how you're supposed to say that, that by 2005, um, the Burmese star tortoises basically were extinct in the wild uh, due to the pet trade because they're extremely pretty and uh, they, I say, they just have no defense against this. Um, reptiles are fairly hardy and so they can survive much better than birds for long periods in transit, so they're extremely popular for the pet trade. So wildlife crime for these sorts of species, it's not just people smuggling the odd thing in their socks that we sometimes read about in the news. It's very large scale, it's organized crime, and it's closely linked to other forms of crime. So for example, these are all bear paws up here. This is one shipment of ivory confiscated in, in Hong Kong um, and the scale of tiger bone trade. And the, the guys that are doing this are criminals that smuggle drugs, they smuggle guns, and they smuggle wildlife. So we're dealing with serious organized crime here. The other thing that protected areas can't help us with totally is um, species that range outside them to raid, uh, to raid cattle, or, or if people uh, graze their livestock inside the protected area, 
big cats such as this jaguar here will come out of the protected area and eat those livestock or else they'll eat them on the inside. And if you're a, if you're a, a poor villager, uh, your livestock are really important to you, uh, you then go out and kill the jaguar. And it's a, it's a common cause of threat to jaguars. So that's the other thing that we need to do more about beyond just creating protected areas. So what can we do? Our approach is long-term commitment on the ground at key sites. We're in this for decades at our, at our key sites. We don't just zip in and out. We're science-based. As I say, we record what the, uh, what the problems are. We monitor progress as to what's going on. And we adapt what we do. If we realize that what we're doing isn't enough to save a particular species, we change what we do. And we're also pragmatic. Uh, it's been said we do what works. So what we would do for, this is uh, Hoi Ka Keng Reserve in Thailand, what we would do here in this patrol here to, uh, to uh, uh, conserve tigers is not the same as we would do in Bolivia to conserve jaguars. Some of the elements are the same, some of the elements aren't. We, work, we do what needs, what needs to be done in that place at that time. So just running through a couple of examples of where this approach is clearly working. This is the tiger, purely out of interest, that tiger had just killed that gower, and it's seven foot high at the shoulder, so that was a pretty, pretty good evening's work for that tiger. Historically, uh, tigers, uh, the problem was habitat loss. Um, this is a part of Vietnam, which would have been tiger range at one, at one time. Now it's one of the most heavily populated and, and, um, and cultivated place, places on the planet. Um, historically, particularly during colonial times, there was hunting for predator control and also for sport. Uh, you may, if you're an Anglophile, recognize that lady in the middle. That's the Queen of England. Um, more recently, hunting of prey. Uh, tigers need a large prey base. If there's bushmeat hunting uh, takes out the prey, then the tigers also go. And as I say, the core recent threat is this problem of direct hunting for traditional medicines. So what do we do? First, we consolidate protected area systems and corridors. Asia is so heavily inhabited that, and cultivated that a lot of the, um, uh, the reserves are, pr are too small for a, a, for a whole population of tigers. So as here in the Western Ghats in India, we make sure the entire landscape is tiger permeable and so tigers can range through that whole area. Within the protected areas, we do very strict enforcement or we support governments to do strict enforcement. And we do that by, again, a fairly scientific-based approach using a system, uh, using GPS systems to track where uh, the rangers are going. So these guys will have a GPS, which is recording where they go. It's very user-friendly. If they see signs of a tiger or prey, they'll note it down. And so we, it's all geo-referenced. If they see signs of poachers, they'll note it down. And so from that, we know where are the core wildlife areas. We know where are the core problem areas. And we can map out where to do the most effective cost effective efficient patrols. But even that, if you've got these high-end criminals uh, working in generally in fairly low governance countries, uh, we're also trying to break trade chains outside that by having um, intelligence uh, networks and anti-trafficking units outside that. So this is in uh, Indonesia where they Caught, did this big bust of, of stuffed tigers. And in Indonesia now, in parts of Indonesia where we've been running these, working with the government on these wildlife crimes units for several years, we're starting to hear um, that some of the uh, tiger kingpins in the trade are now saying, it's not worth it, the costs are too high, too many of my compatriots have been arrested, which is great. So where we do that with enough resources, it works. So I showed the picture earlier of Hoi Ka Keng in Thailand being patrolled. Uh, over this 10-year period, patrol effort increased hugely. The Thai government was encouraged by all that was going on, and their investment has increased by, uh, by 75%, while tiger numbers have gone up by 50% within the last 10 years. And tigers are now recolonizing surrounding areas. So if we do the right things, we can be really successful. Looking at African forest elephants, which tends to be rather a depressing picture. There's some problems of, of loss of habitat, but the core problem clearly is killing for the ivory trade. What do we do? We work with governments to establish protected areas again, strict protection of those protected areas with, with our GPA-based patrols. Now, interestingly, we're fairly high-tech inside the landscape. 
The best way for ivory to stop trafficking outside the landscape as, as, uh, as um, the ivory moves out along the trade chain is very low-tech. It's sniffer dogs. You can train sniffer dogs to sniff out ivory in containers and in, uh, in trucks like this one. And so we've been working ourselves and with partners and, and our partner governments to deploy sniffer dogs at key uh, points in trade chains and ports and airports uh, in different parts of Africa. And they're being very successful in, in picking up this, this ivory. And the other thing we do is work very closely with lo local communities. Elephants, if their numbers are anything significant, they go out, they crop raid, and if you're a very poor farmer, that's a problem. So we work very closely with local communities to make sure that they're really engaged in the plan. We make sure that they're employed and have jobs. Some of the more remote parts of Central Africa, we work to make sure they have schools and clinics and are benefiting from having elephants and conservation in their home areas. Again, if we do that with enough resources, it works. Where we're supporting these GPS patrols, elephant numbers are seven times higher than in places with no patrols. In Nuabali and Doki National Park in Congo, where I know some of you have been, elephant numbers have remained stable since 2006 in spite of these plummeting numbers in, in other areas. And in Konkwati National Park, also in Congo, where elephant numbers have been really depressed, they're now climbing back up again. The jaguar, a uh, slightly different uh, picture here because I say you've got a bit of loss of prey, but this is these retaliatory killings that are really the problem because protected areas don't protect them against that. What do we do? It's clearly very important to work with local communities again there to develop wildlife commu community wildlife plans to enforce habitat protection, but also to work with the communities and ranchers on good livestock management, bringing the cattle into, into corrals at night um, and uh, not ranging their livestock through the protected area. Again, it works if we do it right. Uh, at WCS sites where we work, jaguars are increasing and have been increasing for the last 10 years at 9% per year. And again, they're probably now recolonizing surrounding areas. My final example is a very contrasting one, is the Burmese star tortoise. As I say, it's all about the pet trade. And so to tell you about this one, I'm going to show you a short piece of film uh, by Steve, with Steve Platt, who runs our program in Myanmar to save the star tortoise. Burmese star tortoise is a critically endangered species of tortoise that's endemic uh, to the central dry zone in Myanmar. It's this desert-like region in the very center of the country. And when we say they're endemic, we mean they're found nowhere else in the world. They're also a very pretty tortoise, and they caught the, the eye of tortoise collectors, and people started paying a lot of money for them. There were very few in captivity, and so uh, people started going into the wild and collecting them, basically just collected them out, uh, drove them to near extinction. Uh, the first thing that Wildlife Conservation Society and the Turtle Survival Alliance did is we conducted a number of surveys in the late 1990s and identified the problem because these animals were going extinct in the wild um, and we didn't even realize that was taking place. So once we realized that there was a crisis on hand, we began to assemble animals we ended up with about 175 tortoises that had been confiscated. That was our founder stock. Um, and then we began to breed them. Uh, we now have in excess of, of 14,000 of them in captivity. So we've gone from 175 uh, global population of 175 up to now over 14,000 uh, tortoises. Our ultimate objective is to have about 100,000 star tortoises in the wild to restore viable populations in every protected area within the dry zone. And so we've we've uh, started at one. Uh, one protected area, we, a small protected area, we figured out how to do this, how to get them actually in the wild, successfully living in the wild. We recently branched out into a, into a second protected area and we've got our eyes on a third, much larger protected area. Uh, this has really been a joint uh, venture between Wildlife Conservation Society, Turtle Survival Alliance and also the, uh, the Myanmar Forest Department. Uh, the Bronx Zoo played a pivotal role in the, uh, in the project. Um, for one thing, they were, you know, uh, early on, the, the herpetologists there, we didn't really know how to breed these tortoises in captivity, so we had to rely on expertise from the staff here at the Reptile House. We had both the Reptile House here and also the Wildlife Health Program 
uh, were, were uh, uh, players in the game all along. There is a parallel between the situation with the star tortoise and the situation with the American bison a hundred years ago. We often talk about in the, in the conservation business of the importance of captive breeding and the role of zoos in, in conservation. And I think this is a really good example where we've had the field people, the zoo people, the health people, everybody's been involved in this effort, uh, a very successful effort to bring the star tortoise back from the edge of extinction. So just to conclude then, we can save imperiled species. We do so by science, by understanding the issues, by working with governments to create protected areas, by targeting actions for species that need additional protection beyond that of the protected area, for example, from wildlife trade and from human wildlife conflict and also potentially from disease. And we can draw on amazing expertise across the whole organization. Thank you. At this point, I just wanted to call up our colleague, uh, Dr. Rosenbaum. Dr. Uh, Rosenbaum is a director and senior scientist for WCS Ocean Giants program. And um, I think um, one of the things that you'll be most surprised of is the wildlife that is actually just uh, right around the corner. And I'll leave it at that. Howard. Thank you. John, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And I think my talk here will build nicely upon the, the, the scene setting that John and, and uh, Liz have done. And I'm gonna take you into a whole different realm, into the marine environment, to talk to you a little bit about our work on whales and what we do to save ocean giants. So oftentimes at these events or at cocktail parties, people say to me, Howard, how are the whales doing? And um, and it's, it's an interesting question. I'm going to flip it back to you, and hopefully you have a chance to talk to you tonight um, at the reception. But just I wanted to point out that there are over 80 species of whales and dolphins. Um, the mustached whales, the mysticetes, are the baleen whales, the large whales. And the toothed whales and dolphins, the largest which are the sperm whale. So it's, it's, it's not a trivial answer. But in this, in this glimpse tonight that I hope to give you is that I'm going to give you four short vignettes, four snapshots of how whales are doing um, how they've recovered from a legacy of commercial whaling and the, and the modern threats they face. So I'm going to start by taking you to the southern hemisphere and talking about southern hemisphere humpback whales. Um, and then we'll move down to the South Atlantic and talk about southern right whales. Um, here we'll be talking about the whales um, around Africa and Madagascar. These animals are found uh, circumpolar, but we'll be talking about their, their habitats around Argentina. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you about the whales of New York. Uh, y yes, you heard me correctly, the whales of New York. Um, and this is an astonishing comeback story, um, but one with some cautionary notes. And I'm going to talk about the humpback whales, the North Atlantic humpback whales, and the North Atlantic white right whale. But first, in order to do so, I have to talk to you a little bit about this legacy of whaling. Um, um, before I'll do that, I, I want to talk to you, I, I'd, be, I'd be remiss without mentioning the plight of, of dolphins and small cetaceans that are largely threatened by entanglement in fishing nets, um, sometimes direct hunting as well, that kills over 300,000 animals a year. I won't have the chance to talk about that tonight, but I'll be happy to, to address some questions in the Q&A or um, during the reception. But astonishingly, um, when we've looked back at all the whaling records, um, over the last uh, 100 plus years. And this doesn't even include the historical whaling era. I'm just talking about modern whaling in the 20th century, at the tail end of the 19th century. Almost three million whales were killed throughout the world's oceans. And, and what we're confronted with today is that legacy, that slow comeback of populations. But these whales are making a comeback, and there is hope. Um, but as these whales, um, return from this large, extensive killing that occurred throughout the world's oceans, um, these animals now face a renewed um, set of threats, 21st century threats, that, that impinge upon um, their ability to, to survive in today's oceans. It's a different world out there. And some of that revolves around industrial development, whether it's um, the oil and gas, whether it's uh, oil and gas development and exploration in important habitats, or even renewable energy. Um, in a lot of these habitats, um, there is extensive shipping um, as well as overfishing. Um, and interestingly, when you add all these up, they have an aggregate or cumulative effect. And this can be seen 
um, in terms of what it actually does to whales. It leads to, in, oops, go back one. It leads to entanglements. Um, the noise from some of these activities, whether it's pile driving or seismic surveys, can disrupt vital communications and even drive whales out of a habitat or even cause physiological damage. Um, ships coming through these areas um, can, can lead to collisions which can result in injury or death. So for our strategy, much of it follows on um, what we have, uh, Liz, highlighted in the terrestrial realm. Um, and as John highlighted, we are working in the, some of the most important regions around the world that are important for biodiversity. Um, part of our program is centered around uh, marine protected areas and coral reefs. And the other is centered around these important areas um, that are important for wildlife. Um, particular sharks and rays and marine mammals. And if we look at that in these regions, and again, we are working in, in of, these, of those regions that John mentioned, nine of them have a marine, um, well, I guess you say fin print rather than a footprint. Um, and we are working um, uh, in these nine, um, including the work here in our, in our New York waters. And they stretch from the Arctic all the way to the South Atlantic and the South Pacific to both coasts of Africa into the Northern Indian Ocean into the Bay of Bengal. And we use um, the model that, that Liz highlighted in her talk. We use cutting edge field conservation science to, to define these important habitats and find out about the needs of whales in order to protect, best protect them. And what we do um, in the marine realm is, is use this science to guide um, the, the, the implementation of the most biologically important habitats where we'll establish marine protected areas or sanctuary for the, sanctuaries for these animals. Um, but it's not enough just to do that in one site. We have to mitigate impacts from their most threat pressing threats along their migration routes. These, these whales undertake some of the longest migrations of any species. So it's not, just in, we can, it's not just enough to protect them in the breeding grounds or in the feeding grounds. We have to mitigate threats as they migrate as well. And then we also have to engage in international policy arenas like CITES or the International Whaling Commission's decisions every year to, to um, engage and use our science so that effective policies protect these populations from um, the most important challenges. And so the work that we've done on, on Southern Hemisphere humpbacks has largely focused on 20 years of science to protect and ensure the continued recovery of these animals from that legacy of whaling. Um, and here you'll see, just to, just to orient you, um, here we're talking about whale populations that breed in calf off the coast of Africa in the Gulf of Guinea, off the coast of Gabon and Congo, and these are shown in red, um, in the Western Indian Ocean along the East African coast and along the coast of Madagascar in this area in Antanjil Bay. I first um, set out on a, an expedition here to first find whales in 1997, 20 years ago, and little did we know that this is one of the most important breeding grounds in the Western Indian Ocean. But then these animals undertake this extensive migration, and this is what I was talking about, protecting them along the migration route, to areas in the nutrient-rich Antarctic waters where they feed, and they repeat this annual cycle. So after 20 years of our science and setting up those protected areas and mitigating threats and, in, and our engagement at the IWC, I'm happy to report on some of the extensive recovery that we've helped ensure for these populations. Here, and color is showing now, here are these animals in, I'm gonna orient you, you're gonna get a little primer in IWC science, so I hope um, you can follow along here. So here in, in orange is the, the, the Gabon, Gabon population of humpback whales, in green, the population of Madagascar, um, of whales from Madagascar. These estimates, ranging from, from uh, about 10,000 to 20,000 animals, date back to that 100-year-ago period. And this was, just so you're aware, was cutting-edge science at the time by New York Aquarium curator Charles Townsend. He figured out a way to, to back count from the whaling logbooks and figure out how many whales were killed and translate it into a population estimate. Those estimates are used today to say, how are whales recovering? Um, and so from that, we know that the Gabon population at the, at the, uh, at the very beginning of the, of the 20th century was about 20,000 animals, and uh, the, the Madagascar population was about 10,000 animals. Here's the, here's the signature of whaling. And through all of our efforts, starting right about here, um, we've actually ensured that recovery of these populations such that the Madagascar population may be as much as 90% recovered, and the Gabon population is on track um, and recovering um, almost 70% recovered. 
Um, so this is, a, this is one of the success stories, one that we should take pride in, um, in the marine environment. You'll see here um, a little bit of an interesting and similar story for southern right whales. And, and I don't want you to get lost in the varying curves, but what you should um, point out here, um, here is you'll see the, the, the tremendous effect that whaling had. Um, this is one population of whales. Again, those bat counts going back further, about 200 years, 150,000 animals, severely depleted, almost down to 60 females. And then as they started to come back up, um, we wondered why weren't we seeing these animals recover? Well, it was because there was a legal Soviet whaling going on in the 1960s through about 1980 that that completely depleted and knocked these populations down. And, and, and once that was recognized and countries um, started protecting their natural resources and the environment like whales and WCS started engaging in a number of these places, we started, whales, we started seeing these whales making a comeback. In fact, southern right whales were the poster whale, if you will, for recovery. Um, estimates range wide for these populations were 20,000. You saw that it was knocked down in one population to as few as 60 females. The population off of Argentina um, was estimated most recently at 7,000, rating you know, an annual rate of increase of 7%. We were on track, this was going to be another success story. And then something started to happen in the 1990s, probably as far back as the late 80s, and then certainly in, in, in 2000. The largest whale die-off in modern history. 700 calves on their breeding grounds um, to date have died, along with a number of adults. Unexplained, no, no cause could be determined. Working with our health teams, we don't know what the actual cause is. There's no, there's no signature for this die-off. It's one of the great mysteries, and it actually has turned around that rate of recovery. So, Myself, working with WCS teams and a team of international scientists have come up with a, a range of hypotheses and through science, scientific methods, we've whittled down what are the most likely causes. It still could be some disease that we haven't yet detected or something where there's a harmful algal bloom which, which causes these whales to come to Argentina in this important area where they migrate to um, in Peninsula Valdez and die there or something that's occurring causing stress in other parts of the environment when they leave this critical breeding and calving ground off of the coast of Argentina and go elsewhere. But we didn't actually know where they went until we started this work in 2014. And I'm very happy to show you, this is the first time we're actually showing this data. You're seeing this sort of hot off the press. This is our satellite tracks of individual whales for each year, a range of animals that have been tracked from 2014, 2015, 2016, and this is the new data, 20, 2016 and 2017, where we're actually beginning to figure out where these animals go once they leave this breeding and calving ground. We feel that somewhere along these routes, that this is where the answer to this question of the die-off is happening. And if we can begin to solve that, we can perhaps begin to address the threat in one of these areas and certainly shore up our protection in this breeding and calving ground you know, off Argentina where, where these animals return each year. Finally, I want to take you to the whales of New York, a true recovery story, an important ecosystem, and um, one which we have the pleasure now to work on and, and continue um, these amazing uh, journey for the whales. Um, I bet many of you didn't know that we have the largest animal that's ever inhabited the planet, blue whale. Um, the second largest animal, the fin whale, which actually may be the true New Yorker, that may live here year round in New York's waters. Really exciting. This is really just very new data. Um, the, the extremely charismatic North Atlantic humpback whale and the highly endangered North Atlantic white right whale. But I'm going to play you a short video right now that was just aired on Science Friday on NPR to kind of talk about this, this amazing um, recovery that we're just seeing over the last five to six years. Largely driven by clean water, so several decades of effective environmental legislation, and an important prey base. So if we can cue the video, this will give you a little, a little introduction to the humpbacks. I think it's one of these amazing wildlife spectacles when you actually see these, these bait balls or these large schools of Menhaden. Those are small schooling fish. Sometimes these pods are they're like the size of a football field. When something ripples through the surface across the bait ball, typically there is a predator either nearby or just beneath them, it could be a shark, a large fish, hitting, if you will, the outer portions of that school. 
and then to have some of the largest animals that have ever inhabited this planet, you know, feeding on them. I mean, that to me is an amazing marine, you know, wildlife spectacle just miles from beaches that people enjoy on the weekend and even at other times with the New York City skyline in the background. So I bet, I bet I've been on the boat closer and in time a distance to get to see those whales than many of you will take to get back to your homes tonight. So this is occurring, as you can see, right off of our shores. It's really, truly amazing. And these humpbacks are feeding on the small schooling fish known as menhaden. Um, they're here um, in impressive numbers. And um, we're out there applying those same techniques that we've, we've used to ensure the recovery of southern hemisphere humpbacks. But there's some important decisions that are being taken um, just this month about should we increase the catch of this fish because they are doing well? What will that do to the whales? And we're engaging in these processes so that we can ensure this recovery. I mean, this is a really amazing ecosystem recovery that's driving populations of whales, sharks, and other fish to increase in New York's waters. But as these animals come back and make this return into New York's waters, they're coming into an environment that has completely changed from, you know, from that legacy of whaling. This is now one of the most urbanized marine systems in the world. And what you see here are the shipping lanes that come in and out of New York. Um, these are areas of fishing intensity, these colored blocks. And right here is something very new that's about to come to New York. This is renewable energy. Very interesting, clean energy, something that we're all, we're all very interested in and, and would like to see, but we want to see it done in a responsible manner that is effective for uh, wildlife that also inhabits these waters. And all of these activities combined um, produce an extensive amount of ocean noise, which can um, affect these animals in, in really negative ways. Um, it, from anything from um, behavioral disturbance to physiological damage, and unfortunately they can't put these uh, ear mufflers uh, across their ears. But many of these sounds are actually what, what some might consider above the threshold of what could be tolerated in your workplace. But com what comes with that are these ship strikes entanglements, and there's something else that's interesting to mention. As we're seeing this recovery, and I, and I, and I mentioned that mystery of the die-off in Argentina in particular reason, we're now seeing that in our own backyard in the North Atlantic. Both of these populations, and again, I've only talked about one right now, the North Atlantic humpbacks, are undergoing what's known as an unusual mortality event. Some of it can be attributed to ship strikes. The other part, we don't know. And we have to apply some of those lessons that we're learning from in Argentina to the waters of our own backyard in New York. Finally, this is story um, is, some, is one of, of interest, recovery, and also some, uh, has a sad note to it, but I'm gonna leave you on an uplifting note. Um, these are the North Atlantic right whales. These populations haven't recovered from that legacy of whaling. And in fact, as, as, as recent as 20, 25 years ago, they looked like they were sliding to extinction. About 300 animals, okay? There are more people in this building than there are North Atlantic right whales on this planet. But over the last two decades, these populations were recovering to about 500 animals. It was a slow sign of recovery, a positive one. But over the last six months, these animals started to use a new habitat in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, one that didn't ensure all the types of protections that they, that they find elsewhere in the North Atlantic, given their endangered status. And I'm, I'm sad to report that this year, there were 16 deaths of North Atlantic right whales in a population of 500. We lost two decades of recovery. Um, there were only five calves born into the population this year. And so the lesson that we need to learn here in New York is, is that we need to protect these animals as best as we possibly can as they potentially move into these new environments that we don't exactly know why. Is it due to climate change? Is it due to a food source? But we see this happening, and this is what happened in Canada. And now we have a responsibility to do this here in New York. And fortunately, with the support of the G. Unger Vettelson Foundation and our collaborators from Woods Hole Oceanographic um, Institution, we are applying technologies that can help prevent those ship strikes that are killing, that kill those whales and some of those other environments. So in, in and around the New York Bight, 
We have, a, we have some of the highest ship traffic in the world. We also have these whales just about to start, start their seasonal migration, migration coming into these waters. Any day we'll get, we'll get notification that right whales have been in New York waters. And we have located 22 miles off the coast of New York, right at the nexus of those shipping lanes and the wind energy development, a real-time buoy that will detect the calls of a North Atlantic right whale. It will go up to the surface on the satellite, across the satellite, and come down to the server at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and I can get an alert right on my cell phone that a whale is calling in near real time. This is a proof of concept, but with the right motivation from you know, various stakeholders involved, government, shipping industry, we can put buoys like this in and around the New York Bites shipping lanes to mitigate um, impacts from ship strikes to whales. And hopefully, with, uh, with Ocean Wonders from the New York Aquarium opening in, in summer 2018, we'll also hopefully have some ability right here for you when you're on the boardwalk on the rooftop deck to get a notification that, that there are whales vocalizing in the New York Bite. So I hope I've given you a glimpse into how the whales are doing. It's not a straightforward story, but there is some hope and there are some challenges ahead. And you can track some of our progress through um, one of these campaigns that John Cavalli uh, mentioned. And in fact, you can find the latest on the buoy and the detections at blueyork.org. Um, so thank you. Please take a seat. Thanks. So, at this point, I'd like to have Liz come up, and um, before we start the program, I did want to uh, recognize a couple of my colleagues, and we always start with the chairperson of the board. Uh, we are very fortunate to have with us our chair, Antonia Grumbach, here. So please thank you, Antonia, for being here and for all the work that you do. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my colleagues because a lot of the work that you've seen here today has really been this collaborative effort within the organization. Our our CEO and President, Dr. Christian Samper. Uh, star of stage and screen, you may have seen him on, uh, on television, uh, uh, James Brehenny, uh, the zoo director, and uh, wonderful, wonderful, good colleague. Has anyone seen the zoo? There we go. Some, some and more importantly, his better half, Kathleen Lamatina, who's also a wonderful colleague. I mentioned Dr. Pat Thomas um, uh, earlier, and our general curator, and also my colleague, I believe, Paula Hayes, who's head of our global resources, are here is here as well. Thank you very much, Paula, for being here. So, with that, I'm going to just uh, sit down with my colleagues here, and I'm going to take this opportunity to ask the first question. If I was sitting out in that audience listening to the two of you, I'd be like, "Wow, I well, it doesn't sound too good. Uh, things are kind of okay, not okay." Are you optimistic or pessimistic for the future? And Liz, let me start with you. In terms of localized areas, uh, I'm optimistic. We know what to do, and we have enough resources to do it in certain confined areas, the areas that I talked about. What I'm less certain about, I won't say I'm not optimistic, but I'm less certain about is how we can scale that up. Because the way we work really intensively on the ground is incredibly effective at those sites. Um, and we're proving that it is very effective at those sites. But you have to do that work at every site. Uh, and so, for example, um, for savannah elephants, uh, recent moves um, by Kenya and Tanzania, they've been un under intense pressure to increase their enforcement. They have increased their enforcement. Poaching there is going down. It's gone across the border to Mozambique and into Central Africa. So the trafficking networks are still there, but they've moved. So we have to be everywhere. And it's bet between us and our partners doing this intensive work everywhere while these threats remain. So it's, it's how we can scale that up that I'm less optimistic about, I guess. Got it. So I'm cautiously optimistic. I think like, people know me as a realist. Um, I generally have a positive attitude toward all the work that we do in the, and especially in the marine environment. I, I think there are really tremendous signs of, of progress for whales and dolphins around the world. Um, from where we started in some of these places 20 years ago and seeing these signs of recovery. There is some uncertainty like that case with the southern right whales, but, but, it, but, it's, but the animals are still overall increasing. I think one of the greatest challenges though is, is that as these animals, these populations increase, 
um, and begin to increase in number, they face some of these the, the greatest challenges in this marine environment. It's a changed world, there's a changing climate, and the North Atlantic right whales are, that's an extreme case. But, but I think what we also see is that political climates can offer quite big setbacks. And, and I would say that what we experienced at the tail end of the last administration was a wave of, of realistic euphoria and optimism, and now we're, we're right back into trying to protect these really important environments in the Arctic um, and, and, and in, in, in New York, and the world's watching. It's an interesting time for this, and particularly as, as, as many of these governments and our partners and WCS work around the world to, to protect these species and those important habitats. They're, they're looking to the U.S. right now to see what we do. Okay, I'm going to open up. I, our colleagues are here with mics, but if anybody has a question, wow, these lights are bright. Yeah, sure um, they are. There you go. Yes, right there. It's coming. It's coming. You probably could have, yeah. Go ahead. Anyhow. Yeah, I just wanted to know, when you have a population that has only a couple of hundred animals left or a thousand, how do you deal with the lack of genetic um, diversity? Was the geneticist? <laughs> Was that a setup question? <laughs> <laughs> My background is in population genetics. So uh, it, it, what's really interesting, I actually got into the North Atlantic right whale um, field by actually looking at um, uh, genetic diversity in North Atlantic right whales. And one of the first things we did was, was ask, did they have enough diversity to persist? Were, was this something that we should really be putting our effort into? And we actually looked back at genetic samples that range from 100 to 200 to 500 years. And, and one of the, one of the, one of the, the punchline was it wasn't, it wasn't the, the lack of genetic diversity that was, was, was inhibiting their recovery. And in fact, it's these modern day threats, which is the sole source of, of why these animals aren't recovering. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Those were wonderful presentations, very inspiring. My question maybe is for, I don't know, for the whole team. Um, it's about connecting those wonderful stories you just shared with the visitors at the zoo. Not a TV program or not a, uh, a special event like this, but, but uh, have you thought or are you doing um, uh, sharing these uh, powerful stories when, when, you come, when visitors come to the, uh, to the zoo, especially children? Because I think if we start with young kids and, you know, this is uh, amazing science and things, a uh, positive impact in the world. A lot of wonderful things that I, I'm, I'm sure kids would love to hear. So I just, I'm wondering if you, if you are already doing it or you're planning to do it or. It's funny, we're not doing it, which, no. Um, I'm, I'm joking, of course. I think that's one of the mainstays of the work that we do at the, at the zoos and we can always do it better. And I think that's one of the one of the takeaways. I am excited, though, and um, and Jim and his team has been working on the new exhibit out at the aquarium, the uh, Ocean Wonders, which uh, Howard referenced. And when you're in that new space, you have an incredible experience of literally going to the the depths of the ocean. You're you're going to be in a space with it's 18 feet high by 28 feet wide. This, incredible sense of being, in, we're calling a cathedral, literally at, at the Hudson Canyon, and seeing um, and feeling that sense of connection to the oceans. And after you leave that experience and have learned about the New York waters and, and all the waters where sharks live, you come out and the first thing that you see is ocean plastic. And you see what we're doing to our planet. And then you learn about what you can do to make a difference as a human being. So I think that is going to be transformative in many respects. And we started that work at the, at the Bronx Zoo with the Congo Gorilla exhibit in terms of coming through and then learning what you can do. And those are, you know, as each new exhibit has come on, we've tried to incorporate that element as well. And of course, it, it always comes down to funding and resources, but I think that the team there has done an incredible job and, and I'm very excited to see what's gonna happen um, in summer of 18 and how do we engage people? Because at the end of the day, what we were able to do at the, at the Bronx Zoo, at the Congo Gorilla Forest, is raise over $11 million of funding for work in the Congo. 
So not only are we engaging the public and, and telling that incredible story, but we're also helping to fund the work in the field. So those are the positive stories. And again, I'm always, we're always open to hearing more, and, and Jim will be there later. So if you have any good ideas, don't call me, call Jim. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we collaborate in different places depending on the local. I mean, in some countries where we work, if we got engaged in that issue, we would be thrown out the next day, and then we can't do anything. In some places, we do team with with organisations that are more involved in 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 the uh, in the human population and human development side of things. Um, the other thing that we've been various of our colleagues have been doing work on is looking long term to the future, one of the things apart from controlling population itself that could be on our side is urbanization. Because as increasingly we become urbanized, then that means that um, there's two advantages to that. One is per capita human footprint is less in cities than in rural areas. And again, when you start to have women who are more educated in cities than rural areas, and these all end up being positive for conservation. And at the same time, uh, that's less people living on the land. And so that allows potential for recovery for some of these areas. We're starting to see the first signs of it in places like India, uh, where people are the, the becoming more developed and in the cities. And that then is allowed the space for things like tigers to recover. So looking really long term, that's actually, we can be a little more optimistic about that. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question more for Liz. Um, not that long ago, there was a pretty dire story about pandas in the wild, uh, and I noticed you didn't mention them. Uh, is there a success story? Is there any good news on the panda front over in Asia? Uh, yes, pandas are doing actually extremely well, and they've, their, their, their status uh, under IUCN's red listing status has, has dropped down a couple of notches. I think they're vulnerable now rather than critically endangered. Um, so actually, they are, the pandas are a real success story. Um, China can, we sometimes think of China as a challenge for, uh, for wildlife trade issues, but China has actually done a very good job of conserving some of its own wildlife. Pandas is a good example, Tibetan antelope is another example, where they're actually doing very well up on the Tibetan plateau. Do you want to reference snow leopards as well? Uh, snow leopards, that's right. Yes, snow leopards is another one, not just in China, but across sort of all the stands as well. Um, and they, again, have just been downgraded from endangered to vulnerable. Now, that's partly because of counting methods have got better and we know more what's going on with them. But it's also because, again, they're, they're managing to, to do okay. Yes. Oh, um, so I have... Uh, two questions. One is... Uh, I'm if sorry, you, you only get one question. I really get just one question. Okay, um, I wanted to ask if you had any input on the vaquitas population diversity, if it has any recovery rate, and also the Maui dolphins that were on mm. Times cover and everything, but it seems to have dropped off our radar completely since. Um, and the other part of this was in relation to BRPs and like data on acoustic footprints, and this has been in dialogue for quite a while, but I don't know if there's been any apps like developed or given current technology, if there's any real-time feedback to ships or if shipping lanes have been changed or if the frequency of sound emission from these vessels are being worked on, like, is there any solution sets that we're driving toward on those fronts? That's you. That's a Howard question. We voted Howard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You sure you were? Okay. So, um, yeah, actually, I'll take your second one first. Um, so, and that, that real-time technology that we're using as, as the proof of concept, what we want to do is work with the Coast Guard. First, there's, there's two different um, ways we can, we can work this issue. Um, and we've been engaging with the shipping industry here locally in New York, for example. 
um, to, to actually engage in these issues with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, um, the shipping industry and other, and the Pilots Association. So those are the, some of the key players that are involved in the ship strike issue. Um, if we can use this technology and get that information um, in real time, and again, I, I told you it was near real time, all it takes is opening up that satellite link and, and getting it up there a little quicker. Um, it's a cost issue, wholly. That can get into the, the Coast Guard's alert system, much of the way they use the AIS to know where ships are, they get they get an alert, alert to the bridge and they'll know where the whales are. So that's in process right now. It, it takes quite a bit to actually make that happen. And so we're in discussions with the Coast Guard, WCS and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. There's also um, an app that, so some of this data, and, and thank you for um, asking that, the data is available on our website, Blue York, and, and through the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. But for those that want to see it quicker, um, um, or more quickly, um, we're working and taking it into a little app called Whale Alert. So anyone can download that app and have it, and they can see in near real time those alerts as well. Now, the mariners have told us they won't use that right now because that becomes a safety issue if they're on their, their tablet or on their phone or anything if they're on the bridge. So there's, there's, a, there's a bit of an issue that we have, to work, we have to work the issue so that we can use Whale Alert to get the information out publicly. Um, and it's, uh, someone in the Port Authority can use Whale Alert to kind of know that, but the, the, the folks on the bridge of a ship have to use a Coast Guard Alert. Um, I don't know if you want me to, if you want me to address the second part. Um, what, the, the second question you asked related to um, two highly endangered populations of small cetaceans. The ones, are, they're, they're both um, um, less than 100 animals or about that, um, the vaquita even far less in the northern Gulf of California. And right now, they're actually trying to take animals out of the water and take them into captive areas to captively breed them to save the last of the vaquita. So we're in dire straits there, and we're really hoping for the best. Um, this is, these animals are net entangled, and um, there's been heroic efforts by a number of people to do that, and probably can talk a little bit more about that. Again, the other Another one is the, what's called the Hector's dolphin, the Maui's dolphin, um, and again, uh, suffering from net entanglements, um, gill net fisheries. Again, some of the solutions involve probably just closing these fisheries down or buying these fisheries out. Uh, those are not simple. It involves people's livelihoods. There's illegal fishing. Um, people still go out and fish. And we know that that wholly doesn't work. Um, and so these are, these are um, two species that, um, that, are, we're doing, that are involved in heroic efforts to save them. And you, know, you might come back in a couple of years and we hope we'll have some success. Howard, can I follow up on that? And, and unless it's really, really bad, um, how has it been working with the officials, the public officials? If they're not being helpful, don't say anything. But if they have been somewhat helpful, can you give us a, okay, he's not saying No, anything. no, no, you didn't, give a, <laughs> you didn't give me I'm a chance. Just to, I'm just trying to set you up here. How, seriously, no. how, how have they, have they been open and receptive, I guess, is at this point? I, I would say remarkably, um, and this is the power of, of WCS and the power of the aquarium and the power of social media and everything we've done, as well as you know, some of the outreach that, that we have. The, the, the interest, for example, here in New York uh, on whales is, is remarkable. And, and we've gotten the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey at the table, we've got NOAA, Coast Guard, um, that's National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, the shipping industry. I mean, there are still some folks that really want business as usual because they have not, for the past three decades, they haven't seen whales, right? They're saying, what whales? But there are others that are saying, we can make ships quieter, we can slow ships down, we can do this, and it, it, we, we'll figure out how to bear that cost. They pass it on to the consumer if they have to slow the ships down. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the, the engagement has been really positive. And, and especially from, interestingly, the, the renewable energy folks that are working mm -hmm. here. I mean, there's, there's, there's leases, right? There's an active lease right now, um, and they have five years to, to in essence, um, you know, characterize the site and develop. And there's proposals for other sites here in New York. That will introduce a whole new set of indri industries and ship traffic, but they really want to engage. They want, this, they want New York's waters to be the test site for successful you know, renewable energy, clean energy, but also wildlife friendly. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I think it remains to be seen how this, how, this, um, how this unfolds, but so far the engagement has been extremely positive. One of the things that we did was uh, we actually had, I believe, 13,000 kids 
uh, do drawings and send letters um, saying, save my whale and save the whale family. And I would imagine, I think it was the largest number of, of pieces of data, of, of letters that they had ever gotten. And, and you know, uh, it reminds me of Miracle on 34th Street a little bit. You don't want to tell the kids that you're getting rid of these incredible animals. So well, it was an empowerful. We were, when we were at one of the, it's great. I mean, it's that engagement that we get as the, through the advocacy that John leads is remarkable. And uh, uh, we were down in Washington, D.C., taking our science to discuss some of these policies. And at one particular agency um, that was kind of hearing us out, if you will, leading scientific experts from several universities, aquariums. And one of the, one of the officials pulled us, very senior, pulled us aside and said, this is fantastic. You guys keep the pressure up. He said, 25,000 letters mm -hmm. that come in, we hear that, we see that. So, and a lot of that happened at the aquarium, which is uh, exciting. So, moving on. Yes, sir. What is the connection to research? Oh, what is the, uh, re the latest research on uh, whales, and be whales and dolphins that beach themselves? Mm -hmm. What is the latest research connection with sonar? Mm -hmm. Would it interfering with their sense of direction due to the sonar. What's the latest research on that? Yeah. So um, there, there are established links with certain uh, sonar um, that have actually, that have been shown to cause certain of these acoustically sensitive state cetaceans like the beaked whales, um, a class of animals on that poster that I didn't actually get to talk about tonight. Um, but they're actually found here in New York, right around the Hudson Canyon. They prefer these, these shelf, the Hudson Canyon is, is like the Grand Canyon underwater. And they prefer these areas that drop down to great depths. That's where they feed. But it's also where, you know, I'm not saying that canyon in particular, but where military um, and Navy use sonar for training. Um, it's where subs hide out. It's also the area where these whales feed. And so you can imagine that through um, like distinct efforts led by a number of colleagues of ours have shown that there's a link between these sonars and these strandings causing these animals to surface too fast and, and um, in, as, in essence they get the bends. There's actually something else that's, uh, that's concerning that actually in the latest, and this is something that WCS led in terms of finding out the causes of a mass stranding of melon-headed whales off of Madagascar. And sometimes there's a behavioral response so what happens is there's different types of sonar um, and, and other types of noise put in the environment called seismic surveys that they use for oil and gas exploration. And some of our work in Madagascar, this was led by WCS and colleagues and partners, showed that the response was to drive these animals that are at that deep water, at that shelf break, to come inshore um, to see, they were, you know, in essence, they were, in essence, scared by the sounds or, or confused. And they, that, that sound is kind of like a gating response. It herds them into shallow water. And then, in essence, they can't find their way out and they die. And in essence, we, we, this was, in essence, a, uh, a process that we led with the Madagascar government, with the U.S. government, that actually ruled out all the other scientific causes and attributed it to a type of sonar. That, that led to this mass stranding. So it wasn't necessarily a, like the bends for those animals, like the beaked whales that come up too fast, but the sound pushes them out of their normal habitat and then they can't get back into their normal habitat. Yes, sir. So can you talk about the magnitude of threat um, of, uh, compared to the um, direct Um, for the, the impact of poaching is immediate. Hmm. So um, for something like the ivory crisis, that's immediate. People are, people are in these areas, poaching them now, and that has an immediate impact. Um, things like the, the, the star tortoise story, a lot of other species, that's an immediate impact. Some of these other things are longer term. So if we don't solve the immediate impact, um, there's going to be nothing left for climate change to damage. Uh, but it, we need to be planning for that too, and we need to be working on that too. One of the things that we do on land, and Howard might want to talk in, in water about this as well, is we focus very much on intact forests and intact systems. Um, 
because um, that's why WCS tends to be in these last big wild places, partly because they have the fabulous wildlife populations, but partly because they are shown to be the most resistant to climate change. So they're going to be the areas that will survive um, when some others will, will go, because it's these big patches with their full ecological interactions uh, where they're forming clouds and they're doing all this sort of stuff, which is why we have such an em emphasis on, on intact forests. And on the sea, but I, I, I don't normally talk about the sea um, <laughs> when I'm sitting next to Howard, uh, but we are... Our, our, um, you leave if you'd like, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> our coral reef scientists, uh, we've got a coral reef biologist called Tim McClanahan who is leading uh, the, the world in a lot of cutting edge coral reef research. And he has mapped where coral reefs will be most resilient to climate change and saying these are the areas that we really need to be focusing on uh, to make sure that we keep corals in the future. Can I build on that for, because it gets back to a, a key point in those key habitats. So, you know, that's where we use our science to map these important habitats. And much like Liz had said, I mean, the, the, you, you saw the threats. I mean, the whaling, then the, the direct injury or death from ship strikes. But then if we get into some of these more interesting threats that were raised um, above about ocean noise and shipping lanes, you know, cutting across the world's oceans. I gave you the example here from New York, but we need to kind of scale that up globally. And so we had the opportunity this past um, June, and then again, very recently um, in Europe um, through the United Nations Ocean Conference and our oceans um, meeting that Christian attended um, and convened by the European Union to take, this, to take these issues to the global scale and to get this on the global, on the global stage. Can we you know, protect these important habitats for whales, but can we make them safer by having them more quiet? Can these be, you know, quiet zones that can, uh, that for these whales, that so they can actually communicate with one another? That's especially important in their in their reproductive cycle when they're breeding and, and mothers, talk, you know, communicating with calves. Can these? Can we? Can we have? move the shipping lanes once we've identified these breeding grounds? Can we work with the International Maritime Agency to move these, air, these particular shipping lanes when they crisscross um, important whale habitats? And so working through the United, Na United Nations Ocean Conference and our oceans, we have voluntary commitments that we are working with WCS is leading and with a range of partners to, to begin to address this quieter oceans, safe passage for these animals that, you know, we have a set of targets that we will lead up to that by 2025, you know, in the next eight, seven, eight years, we'll be actually having real measurable progress. I wanted to also pick up on that because I think um, Liz has really been one of the leaders in this whole issue of wildlife trafficking. And um, on the positive side, What's happened over the last five years through the work of WCS, but many of our partners, is really to raise the awareness of the poaching crisis mm -hmm. and using elephants as the example. What people did not know um, or were unaware was obviously the loss, the 62% loss in, in forest elephants between 2002 and 2012, but more than that, the scale um, and estimates range anywhere from eight to $20 billion a year in terms of illegal wildlife trafficking. And in President Trump's first executive order, and he spoke about transnational crime, one of the transnational crimes that he talked about, and for the first time, was wildlife trafficking and, and trafficking in wildlife products. So I think what we've been able to do is raise awareness of these real immediate priorities, the impact it has on national security, and we can talk about that later. But uh, what we did is we came up with a very simple strategy, was stop the killing, stop the trafficking, and stop the demand. What we needed to do was raise awareness of the issue, but we needed to work in the field. So we've identified these sites where we are here long term with training, and that was what Liz was, was referencing. Stop the trafficking is changing the laws because, for example, in New York, um, the laws were, the, the crime, um, uh, the, the, the punishment did not meet the crime, so that therefore uh, it was a situation was really a slap on the wrist. So we increased the penalties. And stop the demand, really, it's about educating our fellow human beings on the impact of what's going on. So you, you specifically reference plastics. I mean, plastics is one of those things that we're grappling with, and there's a, uh, the, aquarium, um, the Aquarium Conservation Partnership has really made this one of its focal points, the idea of what plastic is doing. And here in New York, you may have all recalled the work that, that we did, but working with many others on plastic microbeads uh, that were found in your hair care products. The fact is that in, in Lake Erie alone, there were eight tons 
of this plastic microbead in the waters that these people were drinking. This is not a Democratic or Republican issue, liberal or conservative. Um, right now, I believe there's, we, we are within our, well within our lifetimes, there'll be one ton of plastic in the ocean for every human being. And for, you know, so it, it's, it's stunning, the numbers that we're talking about. Just on plastic straws alone, there are 500 million plastic straws made every day in the United States. And none of those are recyclable, none of them. So where are those things going? Guess what? Your great, 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 great grandchildren will be around with those straws. And what are they doing to wildlife and what are they doing to our planet? So I think you know, we have to be thinking about these things. I mean, there's the short term and then there's the long term. And I think some of that's gonna be about behavior change tied to legislative and regulatory change. Yes, ma'am, behind. So uh, we'll, have a different, we'll have a plastic symposium at some other point, but I think uh, what's really interesting, I have, I don't know if anybody knows, I have white hair, but um, I, I remember a time when we used to get paper bags. I remember a time when we didn't have all the disposable plastic, and I think probably everybody in this room can remember that time. I think we have to figure out a healthy balance between the two. Uh, this is not about becoming going back into the cave. That's not what this is about, but it's just being a little bit more sensitive. And I'm happy to talk a little bit later on because I think there are some solutions to those issues. And some countries ban plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Rwanda's done Rwanda. it for a long time. Kenya has just banned all plastic bags and people are finding alternatives. There are alternatives, but mm -hmm. you know, we, we can do it in a thoughtful way that's not, going to hurt, that's not going to hurt business and is also good for the environment. Yes, sir. And then we'll come back to you. Yes, sir. The only reason to have the mic is because of the Facebook. Marvelous yeah. talks. Oh, and that's all right. it. So, again, thank you for these marvelous talks, but it leads me to a mundane question, which is, it's a numbers game, it looks like, and how do you keep score? I, I can't believe you're tagging every single whale or every single tortoise. So, and yet you spoke confidently, it's 7% up, it's X percent down. How do you do it? It, on, on terrestrial, and then I'll, I'll hand over to, uh, to Howard. I mean, one of the things that WCS has pioneered is counting wildlife, monitoring wildlife. So for tigers, uh, we do it, and it's our, our own Ulas Karanth who really pioneered this for tigers. It's camera traps. Uh, every tiger is in, has individual stripe patterns, and so you put t uh, camera traps out, the, the tiger walks through, it takes a photograph of itself um, uh, through an automatic system, and that then, those photographs then all go in, and now this is all computerized, it can go into a database which can recognize all the individual tigers. So uh, that's how we do it for tigers. For savannah elephants, you can count them from the air in uh, places, and again, the, tech, the, the science behind it, so you, you fly a certain height above the, the savannah and count as, uh, elephants across a certain width, and then you can extrapolate up. For forest elephants, it's very time consuming. You're in dense tropical forest, and even though they're elephants, you can't see them. So that's all done by dung surveys. So the, the, the research that I showed here showing the 62% drop, People walked through the African forests, the equivalent distance from here to San Francisco to here to San Francisco, counting elephant dung, and then working out from that how many elephants are there. So it's, um, it depends on the species, but uh, we know we have to do it. And so we do what we can. Sometimes it can be pretty cost efi efficient. Uh, other times it's just very painstaking. If anybody wants to go and do that in Africa, we we'll take. Um, I have been told, unfortunately, that that was our last question. Sir, I'm ho more than happy to answer your question um, afterwards. Um, first of all, let me start with a thank you for being here and being such a great audience with great questions. Uh, we, we cannot thank you enough. We could not do the work that we do without your support. Uh, you are such a meaningful and important part of our WCS family. So for that, thank you. We look forward to seeing you and answering any other questions that you might have uh, during the reception. And thanks again for standing for wildlife. And have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.